Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. We have an interesting article. Um, as always, if you'd like to read that article, we'll put a link up on traumainformlens.org under episode 67. So uh, to get us started for the week, we're, we're kind of right in the middle between Christmas and New Year's, uh, the three of us. So let's uh, shoot some bright, shiny objects out. Uh, uh, Kurt, I'll uh, let you get us started today. It's hard not to just pick holiday stuff for fun. <laughs> right, it, it's just, just been a wonderful holiday. I've been off work for a few days and really just enjoying that. And I took a, one of the great experiences of living in Colorado, right, is one day it's 50 degrees and the next day it's snowing. Yeah. So I took advantage of one of those 50 degree days and I went over to Golden and rode my bike uh, all the way up Lookout Mountain, which is one of my favorite rides and had a blast coming down. It was great. I was, I was passing cars. I love doing that. <laughs> that was a, it was a great time. Very cool. Jerry, what about you? You know, uh, the last few days have been uh, about kind of hanging out with my grandkids. And I think uh, the, um, the benefit of being with healthy children to kind of understand, uh, you know, that when you kind of work constantly with individuals who are struggling, who've been exposed to violence, who've been, you kind of get skewed in terms of what you think developmentally is appropriate or not, or kind of looking at. So <clears throat> I've really enjoyed kind of spending some time with them. And um, my granddaughter got a, uh, a, a, a phone for, for, so now she texts me every morning. And say, Good morning, Grandpa. So it increases relational connectedness. That's one way to look at technology, right? <laughs> <laughs> Another method of connecting. You know, I, I tend to look at the positives, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you might as well. Right. <laughs> Very cool. I'll throw in another holiday one in there as well. I uh, just uh, had some really good times with some friends and my wife. Nice to uh, just kind of chill out. Um, you know, it's funny when you're not necessarily very close, at least distance wise to, to family over the holidays. Um, it takes away a lot of stress. Don't tell my mom I said that, but, uh, yeah, just kind of nice. I, I, I needed four days. I'm, I'm going to need another four day weekend, uh, to, to just kind of recover and get, uh, energized for some great trainings coming up next year. But, uh, it was just a nice, relaxful time to just kind of be with and enjoy, people. So I, I kind of feel bad for people that feel pressure around the holidays. Uh, two days shipping on Amazon really takes any pressure whatsoever. I used to be that guy on Christmas Eve at the mall trying to find what was left for people. And now I, I got a two day limit, but hey, uh, I don't even have to go to the mall anymore. So uh, thank you, Amazon. Uh, so uh, let's get into this article. Uh, Kurt, I thought it might be a good maybe to just, since we were, were kind of uh, have a two-week break from this series, in case some people are jumping in, just to may, maybe, and it, I think it'd be probably good for all of us to, to stay on the same page, just maybe give us a, a definition, a quick definition of heart rate variability, and, and just maybe some general uh, ideas of uh, a real quick summary of you know, how trauma impacts uh, heart rate variability, what, what, how, and how that kind of compares to a, a, I don't know if healthy or normal heart rate variability is kind of the right words, but maybe just a quick catch up before we jump into this uh, article today. Well, you know, really the, the, the impact of, I think, this article and, and the ideas of fear conditioning and safety learning are really a great index of how trauma impacts heart rate variability. So really, like if you've read this, if, if you haven't read this article, it's worth the read. And I hope that the discussion we have today kind of gives a really good overview of the impact that 
adverse childhood experiences can have on, on heart rate variability. But I do think too, to go back, and this kind of brings in um, the ideas of cortical, subcortical, and, and the relationship to our heart. And even in, if you look at some of the references in this article, it started to go into the connection between the vagus nerve cortical areas all the way to the gut. So it started to go in that direction too. So there's just a lot in this article. So when we think about just a quick overview of these systems and, and how different parts of essentially this whole system works, right? Is we have the autonomic nervous system, which has the basic function of creating different levels of arousal and balancing those out. So the sympathetic division is what drives our heart rate and our arousal system up. And the parasympathetic is the brake on that or the regulator on it. The process of balancing those two things out is regulation. And when they're not balancing out effectively in response to environmental demands, that's what we call dysregulation. And so that's the autonomic nervous system component of it. And then you overlay on top of that, that we have the brain and its connection right to heart, which is in a part of the autonomic nervous system. And that's where we get heart rate is kind of this robust measure of what's going on in the autonomic nervous system. The vagus nerve connects then brain areas to the autonomic nervous system. So we can then start to impact the outputs of the autonomic nervous system with our brain, not just our heart not just our, our subcortical areas. So I thought that was something really important that was brought forward in this article. And one of the first, if you haven't read the first section of it, there's a great description of how this, all these component system, parts of the system work together. And so you have a part of the, the prefrontal cortex, the, the uh, medial prefrontal cortex, which has two kind of areas in it that are both responsible for generating threat responses and inhibiting threat responses. So the dorsal area of the, of the medial prefrontal cortex is really responsible for generating threat responses. And then the ventral part of the medial prefrontal cortex is responsible for inhibiting those. And the way that that part balances out is it's then connected to the amygdala. And the amygdala's outputs then, they're influenced by our prefrontal cortex and the amygdala outputs then are, are um, they give influence over the vagus nerve all the way in our brainstem through a collection of neurons uh, that go from the amygdala and connect that to the medulla or the part of our brainstem where the vagus nerve comes into our brain. And that gets you then to the heart and onto the gut later. And so that's how that all of that kind of system works together. And it, one of the really important um, statements from this, the introduction of this article is that, that the basic overall output of this entire system can be indexed by heart rate variability. So, and this is really important when we think about not just fear learning or safety learning or the extinction of fear responses, but also in our adaptability to environmental demands. And in that, for, for me, that adaptability to environmental demands gets us right into the world of behaviorism and behavior analysis. That's what we study. So it's a nice, uh, I think, looking at things inside the skin, outside the skin, environmental context, and how our bodies then change their ability to adapt to environmental demands based on our internal states. Great article. For, I could go, I, this article has a lot for me um, across these two kind of uh, paradigms and ways of thinking. So can you just really quickly, for those that might be just jumping in, Heart, heart what, what, what necessarily, when you say heart, I think we know what heart rate is, yeah. but, but just give us a little refresher on heart rate variability. You bet. So heart rate is measured in beats per minute. You get a number like 60 beats per minute, meaning that within a 60 second period, there were 60 beats of your heart. Um, one of the things that's interesting about beats per minute and the way that our heart functions is that because this parasympathetic and sympathetic um, activity is, is uh, what we call tonically active. They're both ha happening all the time and balancing one another out. It creates variability in between every single beat of your heart in the amount of time between each heartbeat. And so the amount of time between them varies around some average. And that average is heart rate variability. So it's a measure of the variability between beats of your heart. The more variability that there is, that's indicative of what we call higher cardiac vagal tone. And that's the part that down regulates the activity of the sympathetic, which raises it up. 
right? And that kind of gets you where the, if you have higher heart rate, more beats per minute that you have to fit into one minute, there's necessarily going to be less variability possible because you got to fit in more events within one given period of time. The greater, the greater your heart rate variability, it's likely that the lower your heart rate is, which allows more variability between beats of your minute. You have to fit in less events per unit time. So we get more variability that way. And this measure of cardiac vagal tone or high heart rate variability predicts a whole bunch of things. And in this study, we're talking about extinction of fear, conditioning of fear, and learning of safety cues, which are all really important to the development of trauma-related responses and to the recovery from trauma-related responses. So a really important set of mechanisms and processes that this, this study, I think, just encapsulate and packs right into, into one study. Awesome. Well, well, let's get into suffocating undergrads. <laughs> <laughs> Contributing to the abuse of college students once again. <laughs> I, I would have just loved to have seen how this all worked, but I'll let you, uh, you know, be behavioralists do this stuff all the time. Uh, you know, so, so, so tell us, uh, I'll, I'll let you start to introduce us with this article. Thanks for that introduction and refreshment. You bet, you bet. And, and before we talk about the experiment and some of the results, I want to toss it over to Jerry. And, and, and if there's anything you wanted to add to that, any perspectives you had, Jerry, I'd love to hear those. You know, I, I, <clears throat> I think it's important for listeners to understand we're really talking in this definition about what's happening inside an individual. But these measures can be influenced by the presence of an attentive, attuned, responsive caregiver that can regulate the physiology of an individual so that we can also begin to look at not only what the individual's heart rate variability is, but also what are those factors in that individual's life that is going to influence these measures, right? So when we look at what is, what's happening in therapy, one way we may look at it is, is there a reduction in symptoms or is there um, improved functioning um, in to do it? Another way would be looking at some of these physiological measures to kind of looking at that. So I think to kind of, for those individuals who go, this is really great, but when would I ever think about using heart rate variability is that you're using this stuff all the time. This is just a way to somehow, as you would say, look inside the body to understand the impact of some of these interventions that are and are going on. Yeah. And, and I, I like to just, one other thing to, to bring this to life, because I think when we talk about this without seeing it sometimes in ourselves, I, I've been using an app called Well Tori um, that you can actually get a free version, which is good enough to at least get a reading from. Um, you can upgrade to a paid version like every other app out there. But, you, you know, it's kind of cool to see your own heart rate variability. Um, it brings this, I think for me, uh, having gone through a couple of these articles, even though you know I, I, the polyvagal theory is not necessarily new to me, it really helped me to kind of see my own. Um, and I think it kind of shows a light of where some tools uh, might be going in the future as well. So it's, it's a free way to get your own heart rate variability and you can get a little bit of information at least for free on yourself and then you can dive in obviously and spend thousands of dollars uh, building all kinds of uh, data sets, but uh, just kind of a cool thing to bring it to life as well. Great, great addition. I haven't tried that one. I'm glad to hear you like it now. I kind of want to try it out. It's worth a shot. I, I, I want to say it's inaccurate because I don't always like my readings, um, but I think it's, it's interesting. They give a lot of really great, simple videos to teach you about stuff um, where, where I can't, we're jumping to the research articles. You know, it's kind of like the, you know, hey, I've never heard of heart rate variability before. Here's, here's some introductory things of why and different uses for it. So, um, if you're interested in this topic and really want to look into your own skin, so to speak, it's uh, it's worth doing, and it's just a cool use of technology too, in my opinion. So, uh, 
And you don't have to buy anything if you got a smartphone. So it's, uh, again, you can get it for totally free. So, which is always nice. So the experiment. Let's go for it. Let's suffocate these undergrads. <laughs> so the, the experiment was a new fear conditioning paradigm. I normally fear conditioning has been done using classical conditioning, which is pairing, right? That's different than operant conditioning. Take a drink, everyone. We said, <laughs> it's been like, a while since we used the, the, O. Uh, I know, I know. The OC. <laughs> <laughs> so classical conditioning is Pavlov's dogs, right? That's, that's sound of a bell, sight of food creates a reflex. So that's what this paradigm is. This is not like, you do this, you get a reward, right? That's opera. This is not opera. So this is what we would consider to be involuntary behavior. Uh, you, you get a reflex, you change light levels in a room, your pupils dilate. Right? That's an unconditioned stimulus with, a, with an unconditioned response. That's a reflex. Now we, we know that we can pair other events with that unconditioned stimulus and we can get a response that looks a lot like an unconditioned response. It's just learned, right? So we call it conditioned. And so normally those kind of preparations have been done using arbitrary events or stimuli that are paired with this unconditioned stimulus. This one was pretty cool in that all of this is now happening inside this person's skin. There isn't anything here that's arbitrary. So what they did is they created this breathing apparatus, right, that you put on. And the, the one that the, what this apparatus can produce is any level of resistance to your breathing all the way from very little up to completely shutting off your ability to inhale and exhale, which is incredibly panic inducing for human beings. I mean, we get really scared with that. And we, we have natural reactions to that, which make perfect sense. Right? That's an unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned response. So what they did then is they had, they call we call them CSUS pairings or unpaired CSUS presentations. So the CSUS pairing produces conditioning. If they are unpaired in time, one is not predictive of the other, they don't produce learning. And so that's what we know from behavioral research. So Early can, you say, can you say that again? Yes. So if a conditioned stimulus is predictive, and paired with an unconditioned stimulus. It will produce learning. Okay. Right? If they are not paired, so if the CS happens and it's not predictive of an unconditioned stimulus, mostly that means that they're separated in time. Hmm. Right? Then learning does not happen. Right? So this was, you had a paired group, you had an unpaired group. So one of them underwent CSUS pairings that produced learning because they were close together in time. And then you had an unpaired group where you had a CS that was separated in time by about 30 seconds from the unconditioned stimulus. And you had no learning that happened, right? Or a different type, actually, when you look at the, at the data. So the, the CS was slightly increasing the resistance on breathing. So you had a sense of breathlessness, but you could still breathe in and out, but you had to put more effort into it. So it gave you a little bit of a feeling of not being able to- A little breathe. suffocation. A little suffocation, <laughs> better than all suffocation. <laughs> An asthma attack. And I feel like I should say one more time that this was not done on traumatized children. Like, <laughs> did not re-traumatize anybody to do this research. <laughs> so then the other part was you had uh, the unconditioned stimulus, which is when this apparatus completely shut off your ability to breathe in and out. Right? And they don't, they don't know this is coming. Yeah. The only way they have to learn this is either, <laughs> either that feeling of slight breathlessness is predictive of when you're not going to be able to breathe at all, or it's predictive of when there is going to be separation between when the not breathing is going to happen. Right? So the not breathing part is going to happen six times for every person in this study. It's just whether or not it's paired with this CS, the feeling of slight breathlessness, or whether or not the CS is separated by 30 seconds from that complete breathlessness experience. So, so is this kind of like the, those mouse studies where like they ring the bell before they shock the mouse? That, is that that's kind of the same? I know, but it's not. The difference is that you had, don't have a bell. You have now an interoceptive condition. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So, it's, like you said, it's all internal. Gotcha. Yeah, that's the unique thing about this paradigm. 
So you, that, this is, that's what happens basically, right? So you have the paired group, they go through a little baseline thing, they get one kind of try where they get at the experience of the CS, which is slight breathlessness. And then, you know, there's 22 seconds where nothing happens. And then they get six repeated presentations of slight breathlessness happens and for eight seconds. And as soon as that eight seconds is over, breathing is shut off. Four, they use this measure of 40% of your max breath holding time, your post um, expiration breath holding time. Right? But we all hold our breath a little bit after we exhale and they take 40% of that time for every individual person. And that's how long you're breathless. Right? So, so they kind of 40% to death, really. <laughs> <laughs> These were, and these were foreign college students. So <laughs> oh, yeah. It doesn't they matter. <laughs> so, they, yeah, they have looser ethics requirements, yeah. you know, in these foreign countries, right? <laughs> so you get, that's one group, right? They get six presentations of that. Then you have the other group where they get that CS or the feeling of slight breathlessness. And then there's 27 to 30 seconds before the U.S. happens, where total breathlessness happens. So not only is this CS not paired with the U.S., that, that means that it's predictive that the U.S. is not going to happen for about 30 seconds, which makes it a safety cue. Now you now have a safe period following this CS. So that's an important point from this, from this study. Okay, to that point, questions so far? I, I think you did a great job of explaining So far, that. all right. It's a little bit of a complicated procedure. Is there a learning happening right now, or I want to know? Like Maybe I'm just, I think I might be destroying some neurons at this point. <laughs> I see some leaking out of Matt's ear over there. I'm, I'm, with, I'm with you. <laughs> you, you. I wish your explanation was the article's explanation, because it was a lot harder. Uh, that is part of the fun of is making you read these, Matt. Yeah, I know. I appreciate it. <laughs> so... Now, you, if you look at, 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 there's a figure in the article where it's showing paired versus unpaired, high heart rate variability versus low heart rate variability, right? So there's our second kind of categorization of subjects in this study are people who had high versus low heart rate variability and how did they then respond to these learning tasks? So what they basically found is two major things. And one is that in, 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 they showed some learning um, some learning data that show basically that people experienced fear when they, they learned a fear response through this preparation. That was one thing they found. Then they found that by measuring uh, startle response, they found it um, using things like skin conductance measures, um, some basic physiological responses that showed, yes, they, they acquired fear during this, this experiment. Um, they also found that the startle blink, blink response during the CS started to change based on whether or not people had high versus low heart rate variability in this paired group. So the people in the paired group actually started to have um, less of a startle blink response over the course of the, experience, of the experiment, right? So they started to have, um, they showed that they learned the fear response and that high heart rate variability actually mediated the, the acquisition of that response. All right, so the, the other thing they found is that in the safety learning part, people with high heart rate variability had a better ability to learn a safety cue relative to people with low heart rate variability. So people, the ver reverse of that is also true, that people with low heart rate variability had increased, they actually acquired the fear response faster and they did not learn a safety cue. They could not extinguish the fear response during the, the, the periods of extinction. So that, when you think about how trauma gets generated, right, that, that has a ton to do with our fear conditioning system that we talked about earlier. And recovery from it becomes very, very difficult when you look at these two kind of um, results from this study that with low heart rate variability. So here's, our, here's kind of a, a hypothetical statement that if adverse childhood experiences change heart rate variability and lower heart rate variability, creating less parasympathetic tone, then you're likely to, to have an enhanced conditionability aspect to your fear learning system 
So you will learn fear and it will generate fear responses faster and they will be harder to get rid of later. And so there's a cascade here from adverse childhood experiences impacting a physiological mechanism. And then that both increases the, our, our ability to generate fear responses and learn them. So we're more adaptable in learning fear and we're also less likely to forget it. It's less likely to go away. It takes more time for it to go away. Huge impact there. The yeah, other so, so would this, yeah. this kind of explain like one of the things you, you kind of see, I, I don't know, it might be more of a qualitative example of it, but I think there's some data behind it too is that, that we see that, that folks, again, with a history of unresolved trauma, find themselves in kind of other situations. They kind of, in some ways, walk in unaware into other situations which can lead to additional traumatic experiences. Is that kind of what we're seeing with some of this? Is that being kind of un unaware of the next danger before it kind of turns into the next trauma? It can be a side effect of this process. Okay. That's how I think of it. Jerry, jump in if you want to jump in on, on this one. I, I, I want to kind of jump in with a couple of thoughts about this. One is... This article really talks in, in, in a kind of a physiological way about why we can't just look at adverse experiences. Is that both an individual's physiology and what we know is relational health or relational poverty can make some individuals more vulnerable to adverse experiences and the long-term impacts of those. That's a great point. Or it could become a protective factor. Yep. Right? So we can't just look at adverse experiences, add them up, and say, this is what's going to happen with this individual. Because we, we're learning that there's a, there's a different vulnerability and a resistance and an increased likelihood of generalization and... Um, in, in some ways, exposure as you're talking about, Matt. So I think that's some of the things to kind of look at. I yeah, can, I ask you, uh, can I ask you a question on that? I totally sure. agree. That's what your job is on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, totally, I totally agree that if you look at the individual, let's say, that has an adverse childhood experience, if you we think about just that they have six aces, for example, that they've had – relatively we could i don't want to go in the ace but they, but they've had roughly six uh, you know types of childhood trauma or adverse childhood experiences well we can't necessarily look at the individual and say this person's going to have all these negative outcomes because again the right variables in that person's life they actually might build up resiliency and strength but would would you say if we looked at a hundred people with six aces, we could say of that group, we could say that the, as a group, we could assume that the majority of them would experience these symptoms later in life if they don't get the right treatment. Well, all we could say is they exhibit risk factors. That's what we could say, that the ACE study was done on 17,000 individuals and people with six or more, or actually three or more, had risk factors. But within that group, there's many people who have three, four, five, who are doing well. There's a, and one of the important factors is the relational history they have, but also the impact of that relational history is a more robust physiology, physiology that allows them to be more flexible and adaptive to those types of exposures. So it again is not to say automatically you have this, this is where you're getting. It's a risk factor. We also have to look at what are those protective factors that are going to, in some ways, lead to these kind of outcomes. It also talks about, which is one of the things I'm always talking about in schools is what it and and you Matt may have experienced this you go to go and talk about trauma informed or trauma sensitive approaches the first thing they want to talk about is the most 
dysregulated person in this school. Can you help me with that? Yeah. Right? Is really what we're beginning to look at is there's children who are actually doing well in school but have had exposure to risk factors. Creating a relational environment that's sensitive becomes a protective factor that those children won't go on to becoming problematic. So we're, we're looking at really increasing um, protective factors for those children in schools so that they can in some ways benefit from the relational experiences or the cognitive and eventually increase the heart rate variability if that's one of the measures you're using. So we can't just look at, one is we can't just look at symptomatology because you could actually have a really vulnerable physiology but not been exposed. Mm -hmm. Which means that if you ran into something that was um, safe, two people go out and get in a car accident, one person with low heart rate variability may have really long-term impact from that, mm -hmm. where this other person may not. So I, I think that some of this research is informing us that we bring our own resources based on our, our genetic or constitutional abilities and the relational history we've had to the current situation that's presenting us, right? So th they set up a current highly stressful situation. These individuals weren't the same experiencing this situation the same way. Um, based on, on that, right? So I, I think these are important uh, for us to kind of understand when we're trying to look at this, especially this issue of are you resilient or you're not resilient, mm -hmm. right? Is that in some ways, this individual had certain experiences that allowed them to be more resilient to this situation in the moment where this individual, because of their life history, the same exposure, they really became, and then we say you weren't resilient, is that it becomes, a, in some ways, a, a negative to kind of look at that. But it's on the flip side, these, these measures can be changed by intervention, mm -hmm. right? Is that's really what we're trying to, is what are the interventions? So there's, you know, research now that looking at heart rate variability in yoga. Yoga can increase these vagal tone pretty significantly for those individuals who could benefit from those experiences, right? right. Tai Chi can, as you, you do your Tai Chi, can increase vagal tone. So what we can look at really is not just the negative exposures, but what increases some of these um, protective factors. Yeah, and even with the, uh the measure of heart rate variability we call respiratory sinus arrhythmia. Jerry, we've talked about this one before, that when you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. And when you breathe out, your heart rate goes down. That's part of the balance or the regulation of those, the <laughs> of the ANS. So as you think about yoga, deep breathing, these kinds of interventions, if you exhale longer than you inhale, it will help to regulate your heart rate. And now we know, we have a good understanding of the mechanism that that works. And so that can be a really great intervention as we think about things like schools and where we've got to kind of input and, and also con consider a lot of these things that are happening, like programs that get created, right? Like um, we've talked about PBS before in schools, right? Most kids will respond, like 80% of kids will respond to PBS and most of those will be well-regulated kids. But what do you do for the ones that aren't, right? Well, maybe you need to use a motivational intervention to motivate things like exhaling longer than you inhale and practicing doing that. That might be a very good developmental shift to a motivational program like that, that wouldn't, it wouldn't touch a kid that needed that kind of intervention. Is it, they're not, it's not a motivational problem for them. It's a physiological problem. It's actual capacity problem. And so doing, understanding what can increase capacity, regulatory capacity and motivate it is really a helpful thing to do. If you don't, right. So, so, so in in when you read the article, 
you look at some factors that are related, say, to school, like ability to maintain attention, uh, ability to regulate um, fear and anxiety, ability to, to um, really focus and problem solve. These are in some ways correlated with this heart rate variability measure. So as you looked at, as you're using, Matt, this kind of measure for yourself and getting feedback, you can look at, in a way, in a fairly simple way, if you had a child who was struggling with, say, PBIS, rather than using just reward and consequence, right, for the behavior, you can begin to get some measures and figure out what it was that could be influential for this child to become better physiologically regulated that they'd have more success following the program you said, right? And now that we have kind of either free or low uh, economic ways of bringing these kinds of things to the classroom, what, how can we best kind of utilize that? Because what it does is it changes the teacher's perception of why that child's misbehaving. Well, one of the things I, I find interesting um, and a little depressing in my, I, I'll share my measurements at some point. Uh, I'm still working on getting the baseline number down, but you know, you, you look out in a normal classroom of, you know, 25 or so kids. And, and the interesting thing that I'm learning from the app is that, you know, the heart rate variability might change throughout the day, but a lot of times when I need to work, I'm not physiologically in a place to do that necessarily at my peak. So it gives you like productivity measures and says, hey, you know, to me, oftentimes it says, yeah, you just really need to go to sleep right now. I'm like, well, that would be nice, but I got to work. Uh, you know, it's like, just go to sleep, Matt. Just go to sleep. Don't do anything because you'd be terrible at it. Uh, uh, but but it's, it's interesting of, you know, if you think about the inside the skin and we could get a measure and you look out that classroom and depending on the class and the time of day, you know, you, you might realize that a lot of those kids aren't in a uh, physiological place to actually sit and engage. Um, and yet, I think, you know, if we look at the positive behavioral supports, it's our expectation that at, you know, 1030 that we do math, whether what? your heart rate variability is there or not. And I, well, what I think is a little tough is, well, we can do a little bit of mindfulness practice. And I, I guess I'll throw this question out. My, my firsthand experience with measuring my mind for a couple weeks now is a little bit of deep breathing doesn't make a significant enough change in my heart rate variability to get me ready for that math class, if that makes sense. Is sure. that there, there's a long-term variability where, hey, I could you know, do some two-to-one breathing, love that stuff, I do it every day, and yet it's not gonna get me to a place where I'm necessarily ready for math. And that's been a big insight for me as well, because I think we'd like, oh, we'll just have everybody take a few deep breaths and we'll be ready to learn math. And I don't think- that, Matt, part of that issue is, goes back to your question about what is this for this person? What is this for a hundred people, right? Yeah. So your heart rate variability app is based on a hundred people or a thousand people. Right. So it might not be relevant to you. It may be giving you a message that says you're not ready to work, but that's an average based on a hundred other people. And you have an individual difference there that you might be ready to work. That's your physiology. Yeah. That's where I think a real value of kind of this single case design thinking to intervention is really important and taking like one case at a time. And every, when you're doing applied work, you know, you use some of that hundred people that group data, statistically average data, to help you guide and design decisions. But every decision with a person is based on that person. And so th that's an important distinction I think to make. And, and maybe people start using that and they're like, I feel fine, I'm ready to work and I gotta do this, but my app says don't. But you might not need to follow that every single time, right? It's based on a, a group of people who may be, may be so dissimilar from you that it's not even relevant and it's still averaged. Mm -hmm. So you're still, your physiology is still one piece of that. And I think that's important to bring into how we think about this as well. 
Yeah. I, I think that's, a, first of all, an excellent point, right, to kind of think about that. We, we it, This information could kind of freak us out a little bit, right? But it's not about us. But there are. The other piece, though, I think is very important is um, you have a you have a history and you're an adult, and so when you're when you're tired, you have other coping strategies that help you engage in the task as well, right? Yeah. Is that either when somebody's developmentally younger and they get tired, they may not be able to do that, and if they have trauma in the history, their their his, their ability to engage in those things are less to, to do it, right? So I can be hungry and tired, but I could tell myself in my head, I want to get this done and get a reward from doing this task. And I can wait to kind of go get food. And I have other coping strategies, even though my physiology is sending me signals that it's time to stop. But a younger child doesn't have that capacity, and a younger child who's, who in some ways need states have not been paired with, oh, you know what, waiting, I'll get my needs met, may in some ways react to those same states differently. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where trying to understand that individual and that individual's history is that not only the need comes up, but then there's there, the system of meaning they put to those needs is different. It's like when I get a need, oh my God, I'm, nobody's going to meet my need. I better, I, I can't do anything but go get something to eat right now. I don't care what's going on, right? There's different internal dialogue around that. So I, I think that um, that's where this, I think there was a question between somebody asked, how do you balance out physiological measures and relational measures, right? Is that it isn't one or the other. You have to understand both of those and behavioral measures, whatever you're going to Really, this is just another bit of information that we have to use to really understand the individual that we're working with. So and if I'm, I'm right with all this, kind of from, from the articles and everything we've learned is that Low heart variability is not a state, but a trait. So a trait being more of a long-term characteristic, a state being a reaction to environmental thing. Am, am, I, am, I, am I right about that? That's a good way to think about it because okay. heart rate variability is more stable than heart rate. Okay. Right, but you can have also a longer term state than heart rate variability. I mean, one of the things that we saw from one of the articles we read about predicting affective instability in daily life, heart rate variability was an index of that. So it can change. It is more stable than heart rate on a moment to moment basis. So in that sense, relative to make every state versus trait is a relative distinction every time you make it, right? Mm -hmm. So you can have a gut state versus a heart rate variability state. There are things that are just more stable. Yeah. So it's not like there's just clear distinctions between states and traits all the time. It's a relative judgment between the two things. And so heart rate variability is a, it would be a trait measure relative to heart rate. But there are things that are relative to heart rate variability that would be traits which would make heart rate variability look like a state. That makes so sense. We're, we're really, yeah, we're, we're really in some ways, because a lot of times I think with deep breathing and, you know, again, when I, and I, I think that there's benefit to all of this, I don't want our listeners to get, but like to, uh, during transitions in school, for example, of having people do some belly breathing or two to one breathing, that, that is going to have some impact on state, but right. the underlying trait of heart rate variability is going to take time for that to change right. with right. repeated deep breathing, right. relational things. And that again, else. Matt, that's a really important yes. thing you're saying, right? Is that as, as we practice these, we're sending messages to our heart, mm -hmm. right? That's, that's going to help regulate the state, right? With repeated application of those, we can make a change to the trait. 
but that takes a lot of repetition. Correct. Yeah. So I shouldn't expect just because I worked out or practiced mindfulness that my readings on the app are going to get drastically better overnight, so to speak. It's going to take time to sort of build up and improve over time. We could expect that. And one of okay. the important things that you're-, you're Relative to yourself. About. Yeah. Sure. sure. Right. One, one of the, I think one of the most important aspects of using physiological measures is what you described about, so my ratings on the app will change, mm. right? Yeah. And that's one of the great things about this is that it helps us to have a measure to detect change. Mm -hmm. And it can be a very small measure. And that helps us as intervention agents with our motivation. Yeah. For us to stay engaged in the work and for us to keep our motivation up to show up the next day and keep doing it the next day. And that's so important to applied work. It, I mean, it's showing up every single day. And I like to say every once in a while, you're in the right place at the right time and you get a little magic. Yeah. But the real job is showing up every single day and being consistent and keeping your motivation level stable. And <laughs> database decision making for, for me has been a really effective way of doing that with intervention agents, with caregivers. Right. So, so I, I, I think that's a point. Another point of it is you looked at that app and you took that information and you said, oh, it must be because I'm really tired. Well, yeah, actually, right. they, they, they tell you. They tell I know, really but tired. I'm saying, but then Kurt gave you a different explanation. He said is, that might be that your numbers are different than the average. Yeah. How does that feel to hear a different explanation of the same data as opposed to you're just tired and you're, or you're doing, your body is bad, is that there, there may be a different way to understand that information for you. Yeah, well, I'd like to believe, Kurt, that I'm just an outlier, and uh, I'm, I'm very close oh, to self-actualization. Outlier uh, in so many ways. <laughs> and part of this is like, okay, I can't get like a placebo effect from this feedback and, and really internalize the state that it's telling me. No, but I, I think that's an important piece because our clients have physiological reactions based on their trauma histories. Yeah. And they interpret it that there's something wrong with me or I'm damaged or I'm no good. And when we give them a different understanding of that, just that as an intervention is effective. Yeah. And go, right? back, to our, back, go back to our system. I mean, this is a great point, Jerry, because if you go back to our, what we first talked about is this is a system that goes from our frontal cortex all the way through our limbic system to our heart and gets connected to our gut you can have an intervention that helps somebody to reframe how they look at something and it has an impact all the way downstream in that. And the more you do it, the more repetition that happens, the more chance you have for that to actually positively impact physiology, which right. then in turn loops back and helps to influence cognition right? and behavior. Right. And like all of these things are just related to one another. So you look at where you put your intervention and this gives us one more way of going, am I intervening cognitively? And am I intervening relationally? Am I intervening physiologically or behaviorally? And you can hit all of those. And that helps you just select your intervention so much more targeted and so much more intentionally. Well, right. that's what I think this app does a interesting job of, um, especially again, if you upgrade and pay for some of the bells and whistles, but it's like, you know, one of my skills that I use for self-care is to, to work out because some data is tell five to six times a week of 40, 35, 45 minutes of vigorous exercise is what you need. And yet variable heart rate, you know, information shows that actually if you're not in the right state to work out, you could actually do harm. So it's this freaking stuff is so complex of I've told thousands of people to work out like that. That's one of the best ways to get cortisol out of the body. And then here's an example of, uh, again, and I think if you get into the weeds of it, it might be the type of workout you do. So instead of going on a seven mile run, you might want to go on a three or four mile walk. So, so to speak. So I, I, there, there's the gray area in there that I think you can bring this together, but you know, it's fascinating that, paying attention to your body and, and using some of these measures 
can really guide you in ways that's that's really quite interesting. Again, I, I'm, I still haven't established my full baseline yet with the app, but it's interesting that some of the things that we just think are set in stone aren't always, may, again, research always is challenging that. So again, tweaking things at that level, and I think for me, somebody who thinks about this way too much for a healthy human being to think about things, you know, I can kind of find that gray area. I think, again, if you if you think about some people that are just trying to, okay, I need to feel better, it might be a little bit more overwhelming. But it, but it is fascinating that the, the finer tuned measurements we get, our interventions can be more and more specific. Um, and again, I'm not sure how I would use this with somebody in a clinical setting necessarily yet, but I see, you can see the possibilities there for sure. So, so, and I wasn't using heart rate variability. I was using heart rate. Mm -hmm. And I had one of the issues, we had a, um, a young lady that was at the, at the, in a treatment center. And one of the recommendations were, because she was depressed and she had, is to get her up doing physical activity, right? And so really what they wanted her to do is kind of run laps around this field that you know the field, right? Yep. And so the, just looking at it, she was walking around this field. She would walk around. Well, the people were trying to say, well, you know, she's not motivated. She's not. When we put a heart rate monitor on her, her heart rate was actually pumping at a higher rate than the kid who was in good shape running around the field. Yeah. Right? And so when you say exercise, if you don't have some feedback, you may say is in order to exercise, I got to run seven miles. But if you are, are tired, if you're doing it, you may actually get your heart rate up walking just the same way. And so again, is we tend to take this data from hundreds of people and apply it to every individual that we have in our classroom or we have in our treatment is we really have to understand where this individual is at and where their window of tolerance is at, right? Their window of tolerance. So when their heart, the heart rate gets up above a certain level, they're outside their window of tolerance. And it may be that this other kid seems like they're working really hard, but they're really not working hard, right? So, Again, is your point really is, is that when you go to these, um, listen to podcasts or you go to conferences, really you have to understand you in relationship to, or your client in relationship to what you're hearing. Yeah. Matt, I can give you a little bit too to add on to Jerry's example of how you can use some of these physiological, and heart rate's a great one because it's so easy to get. Like, I, I, I support it. All the, I use it all the time. Well, one of the things you can tie to this kind of single case design idea and like every one case at a time thing is having um, people, kids, adults, this is such a great thing to do is to first check in with your internal state by looking at your heart rate and then just saying, what is that like subjectively to you? And you start matching those up and that's very individual because there's only one person who can say what that feels like to you. Now you're automatically doing single case now. And saying, well, here's what we know about how this applies to 100 people. And now here's what we know about how this applies to you. And you're different than those 100. And now let's talk about what you need so that we can change, like both that your physiology feels like this subjectively and how do we want to change that subjective feeling and start to get like more intentional about that. So one of them that happens a lot that I found with kids with attachment-related disorders is that when people get close to them, they get hyper aroused, right? It, it's not always pleasant. And then when they go away, it's also not pleasant. So being able to titrate the connection based on their subjective experience and using the heart rate to get them to check in with their internal state and start to use that whole system of frontal cortex to amygdala to body, a whole connection in this process Caregivers get adjusted to what the subjective experience is. The client then gets, starts to get organized by their internal state and taking a measure of it. 
then that helps to organize all of the caregivers around them. So really, you know, you can go to, you know, Jerry's suggesting relational intervention. That's a big umbrella of things. Now, relational intervention can be being away from somebody when they need that as much as being with them when they do need it. Yeah. And so being able to titrate that is really key. And this, I, I found that heart rate is a great way to do that. Fascinating. One of the other questions of this that came up, and this, this may just be a, a Mac kind of fluff ball to throw out there, so to speak, is that, so the, the brain, are, are, we, are we confident in saying that the brain is modulating the heart versus the heart modulating the brain, or is it just, a balance. I, I think we've had the same discussion about the gut and brain as well. Um, and I just, as I'm reading this and, and knowing a little bit about the dorsal branch of the vagus nerve and, and all those, those other things that it seems like, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that the heart is coming back into play in such a major way. Whereas, you know, going back into history, the Greeks really thought that the mind was centered and a lot of ancient cultures, I love that they thought the brain was just a cooling system. Um, but but <laughs> it's like, oh, eh, you know, hit somebody on the head and you might see something happen. But I, I just kind of wonder, how is all this focus on the heart, which, which is just some of as fascinating as the neurobiological pieces of it? Do we just look at all our whole body as one part of these nervous systems? Or is there different roles? Can we look at the heart in a different way and bring it back into importance um, in, a, in a different way with this information? So, uh, so more questions. Yeah, so Matt, there was a time that we believed the vagus nerve was motor neurons moving down. So the heart, the brain was sending information to the body. What supported that belief that the brain was right. Mm -hmm. Now we know that 80% of the vagal nerve are afferent information coming from the body to the brain. Yeah. And so it's really an embodied brain is that it, all of these things are, it, are sending information in both directions, right? So one is modulating the other, but the other is sending information back, influencing how that works. So if my body is stressed, that part's top part is shut down. Mm -hmm. I'm being impacted by what's happening in my physio physiology <clears throat> up and down. So your point really is, is that we have to look at this as an integrated or fragmented system. Right? When we're healthy and it's working well, information is being sent up from the body to the brain and the brain is processing it and modulating down. When, when there's some type of distress or there's too much stress, these systems aren't working well together to kind of looking at those things, right? And so that's really what this issue of having the ability to have physical safety and emotional safety. Emotional safety really is my ability to process and integrate and manage what's happening internally within me, hmm. as opposed to just physical safety. I love that definition. And, and so... Uh, Does that answer I, your question? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I guess it brings the social safety piece right to the front, exactly. too. Sure. I, I love that. Great. Kind of a related way of looking at, at what Jerry is saying, go to, to back to that kind of model we talked about at first, right, where you have medial prefrontal cortex to limbic system amygdala to medulla and the brain stem to the heart. Right? Each one of those, that's, each one of those is a part of the system, and each one of them has their own separate outputs. And integrating them is what happens within the system. Mm -hmm. So they all kind of, they all have their own like functions that we study independently of each other. But each one of those outputs then impacts the next one in, in the bi-directional way that Jerry is talking about. So they're all producing things. The ANS produces some outputs. Mm -hmm. right? And that output then 
gets integrated with the heart and with the brain and with the brain stem and with the gut and all of those outputs, then there's a way to, for those outputs to talk to the next level. And all of those then start to interact with one another. So right. we study it independently of one another, but they all function in an integrated way, which is really hard for us to understand yeah. and study. Right? So, it's difficult. So that's why interventions can be top down or they could be bottom up. Can you, explain, can you define that a little bit, Jerry? I, I think that's a great so, Top down would mean I'm using higher level um, cognitive processing to, in some ways we talked about reframing. I'm using a different way of thinking to influence my physiological reactions. But I can use breathing and say, engagement in some kind of um, physical movement to influence my body, which influences my brain, then how I, right? So we can have both bottom up and top down. So you can have somatosensory therapies that say, let's look at what you're holding in your body and, and work with your body to influence how you're thinking, or we can influence your thinking to influence your body, mm -hmm. right? Which is why we have a variety of different um, ways of intervening that in some ways impacts the system. Yeah. Kurt, I, I, anything to add? Boy, this is fascinating. I can't wait to go take my variable heart rate reading well, this, here in the, a second. The, the top down, it goes back to a point we've talked about earlier, which I think is so fascinating that we can have some information that helps us to decide when to do top down versus when to do bottom up intervention. It's just getting us more targeted and nuanced with our decisions about what intervention we do at what time and in what state. All right, so we know that if we're in the right state, we're in a fairly regulated state, top down has a much better chance of being effective. If our state is dysregulated, our heart rate variability is, is low, top down has a less likely chance of being effective. And so we may want to do bottom up. And so all of those, it just helps you, right, to be a little, a little more flexible, a little more targeted, and not get so frustrated when things don't work the first time. You go, oh, maybe maybe I need to take a little bit more information. And I had something I thought was going to work, and it didn't. And then we go, oh, maybe I need to understand why that didn't work, and I can change my direction that still is staying in line with what we know about the brain and the body. Which is important to know because so much of our culture is cognitive verbal, Right? And we tell people what we want them to do. In school, we give them instruction, expect them to do what they want to do, right? And so having an understanding of this issue of bottom-up would change how we would interact, right? So that child who's in some ways dysregulated and we're telling them what it is we want them to do and they're not responding, it might be much better to get them up and take a walk and do something with them so that they can get better and can make use of it, right? As, as looking at that. So when we begin to change our understanding of you're not just the brain influencing your body, it changes. So now we see yoga as a therapeutic intervention. We, we see um, uh, lots of sat somatosensory interventions. We see a lot of why in some ways increasing positive exposure to something could actually be positive as opposed to just we're reinforcing negative behavior. Mm -hmm. That may be true for some, it's not true for all. Yeah. So having some understanding of this really allows us to more individualize our interventions to be more effective. Awesome. I any last thoughts? That's I think a really good way. So, so the article, uh, I know it, it, the, you can tell it spurred on a great conversation, but it really is uh, fascinating as it goes into 
uh, different kind of responses and uh, what, what these poor students, uh, uh, again, I, I'm just glad I didn't have to go through that study. I, yeah, uh, but uh, again, uh, we know more about undergrads and mice than anything else in the universe, I think at this point. So at least they got extra credit, let's put it that way. So hopefully for this or paid. So um, Kurt, Jerry, great conversation. I continue to learn so much. Uh, uh, through this exploration. And so uh, we'll be back next week. Um, I, this will come out uh, in uh, 2019. So uh, wish everybody a, a happy uh, new year. And uh, uh, we'll be back on our regular schedule and look at uh, another article uh, next week. So Kurt, Jerry, happy new year. Happy new year to all our listeners. And uh, I'm going to go check out what this uh, podcast did to my heart rate variability. So <laughs> everybody have a wonderful happy day. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.